Okay, we want to um, finish our discussion of uh, debt and capital structure here. So let's kind of uh, move forward and um, see if we can uh, pull together some of the some of the ends of this discussion. Um, one of the things that we have to be concerned about is the concept of agency. We talked about this in the very beginning. We talked about that there's this conflict between managers and owners. So the owners essentially give managers the authority to manage the firm for their benefit. So again, this agency problem is created because there is a separation between owners and managers. But this relationship also, there's also a conflict between the owners and lenders. The owners want more return. They want the company to take risks so they can get higher rates of returns. But lenders want companies to be more conservative so that the debt that is owed to them is more likely to be paid. So lenders are going to go through a process of trying to figure out how they can maintain um, some control over the benefits or over the projects that companies do so that in the end they can uh, minimize their risks. So we're going to talk about several things here. Well, first thing we're going to mention, let's talk about some definitions. There's something called asymmetric information. And asymmetric information is when one person or one group of people has more information than others. And of course, managers have more information than anybody else. In fact, most owners don't know anything at all about the company's operations on a day-to-day -day basis at all. The concept of something called a pecking order implies that there is a hierarchy that managers use when they get money. That is, they always go to the same place first, and then they systematically work through to get the monies that they need. And what the pecking order implies is that uh, for this, uh, debt is that managers are going to utilize the retained earnings of the company. I mean, after all, they already have them. They're already in their possession. They'll then follow that with debt financing. And then finally, they will do some external equity financing as a very last resort. Now, what this brings into play now is it brings into play dividend policy because dividends impact the amount of retained earnings that's available. The final concept that's in play is something called signaling. And essentially, this is a behavioral issue. It says, look, managers are only going to do things that make owners happy. If management thinks that the stock is undervalued, right, that the stock price is too low, right, then they may want to buy the stock. Because if the stock price truly is higher than it's priced, eventually the price will go up and they'll be able to reissue the stock, just like a regular investor, and gain for the owners of the company. However, stock issues are typically seen as being a negative signal. That is, for one reason or another, management thinks the stock is overvalued. So let's look at the, some theory here. And again, we don't delve too far into theory, but we're going to think about ultimately what this means, right? Let's say that um, we have a value of a company, essentially, is EBIT, operating profit, multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate. Now, so we've left out interest from the income calculation, and we want to divide that by the weighted average cost of capital. So we're going to assume that the numerator for this example, for this discussion, is fixed, so it doesn't change. So the only way to make value go up is to reduce the weighted average cost of capital of the company. So we have a graph then that shows, here's the value of the company maximizes at a certain point. Well, here's the cost of equity, here's the cost of debt, 
And the weighted average cost of capital is the combination of those. So where that point is at its minimum, that is the point at which values increased. So one of the things that managers want to do is to try to find that relationship between debt and equity that will minimize the cost of financing the company. That earnings per share process, the, oops, I'm sorry, I went the wrong, oops, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way, went too far. That earnings per share process, I pushed the wrong button. Let me go back to where I was. The earnings per share process, right, allows us, the EBIT earnings per share approach, allows us to look at different capital structures and understand how sensitive the company is to changes. So in this first example, we can see three different levels of debt. You can see what the profitability level is, and you can find out that there are some important parts, right? There's a place where they talk about, referred to as the financial break-even point, right? For each one of these debts, there is a position where there is a break-even point with financial uh, um, implications. So anything above that then is going to be profitable. We're going to see profits for the company. And you can see that there is a certain point where each one of these levels of debt creates a higher profitability level. So we want to interpret this. We want to consider the risk of each capital structure alternative, right? We want to understand the riskiness of this. And the riskiness is reflected by the slope of the curve, right? If we go back up, you can see that the, this curve is much steeper than the 0% curve. It is much riskier, right? So we want to be able to plot these points, the, the, the profitability and the um, uh, stock price points for these varying levels of return that the company um, could possibly experience. So, we need to recognize, right, what is, where is it that we're going to maximize earnings rather than maximize profit? Are those, or uh, wealth, are those two points dramatically different, right? And because risk premiums increase with increases in financial leverage, we would think that the maximization of profits does not necessarily ensure owner wealth. I keep clicking the wrong button, sorry. So in the end, here we have our picture. Here's the debt ratio. Here's the coefficient of variation. And the company has provided us, or they provided us, with the estimated required return for stock at these different debt ratios. So now we know the after-tax cost of debt. We know the cost of equity. We can then calculate the proportions the weighted average cost of capital. Again, let's go back to our example, our formula, the thing that we've been talking about for the last couple of minutes here. We want to find a place where we can minimize this cost of capital. Where will that happen in this graph? So in this point, again, we had this graph earlier. Here's the profitability. You see that profits are maximized at 50%. The stock price here was maximized at 30% for this particular problem. Where can we find that? Of course, we can create a table. And again, I'm going through this fairly quickly because we're coming to the end of it. The most important part, again, is just the combination of these two pictures that shows that the point where we maximize earnings per share and the points where you maximize share price are not necessarily the same. If these two points were very close together, then maximizing profit and maximizing share price would be equivalent in nature, but they're not. Not that they're always that way, but it is not consistent that maximizing profit provides a point where we would ultimately maximize uh, stock price. So the final chapter that's coming up is going to talk about dividends, and I'll see you at that video.